So this week is the discussion mm -hmm. of labs and questions from yeah. support vector machines. Um, I was able to go through the lab uh, and the code and run through it and kind of understand a little bit how it's implemented. Um, and that's kind of where I got. Um, but uh, but yeah, any anything anyone wants to start with? Uh, for this? Uh, not not. I don't really have anything. I did also go through the lab as well. Um, mm -hmm. I found yeah, this. Pretty, yeah, I mean, I guess these SVM things are useful. I I don't really like these sorts of models that don't seem to have. I like the I like the generative models more than I like you know models where you can find they actually are a model that SVM is not a model at all, right? It's just like oh, we're just gonna this is a way of learning from the data, right? Which is good, <laughs> but um, I don't know. It's a tool. <laughs> Let's yeah, like you're like you're not you're not like starting from a hypothesis and like right. an idea yeah. about yeah. what creates yeah. the data. You just kind of like figure out how to splice it up. Yeah. 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 I mean, I don't have a ton of usually a ton of classification type of problems. Same that work. Um, you know, I'm not like working on something where you're trying to classify dogs and cats and you know, like all the typical problems seem a lot of the time really, uh, I don't know. Like I think in like medicine maybe, I don't know with like, you know, diseases and classifying someone's, you know, a disease or something based on images, but that's like, you wouldn't use this for that. You would use some kind of neural net, you know, mm. but. Anyway, one thing, I mean, as I was going through the lab, one thing that I noticed that I thought was interesting was the, um, seemed that like, I was impressed how flexible the radial kernel could be. Um, like when you're looking at the output yeah. with these classification plots, like it's a pretty, you know, you know, jagged and not like, it doesn't, it's like, I think from the book, I ha was under the impression that it had to be sort of circle like but mm -hmm. these are just kind of like blobs that it's able to you know draw boundaries around um i thought that was kind of interesting here well, I, I think screen. one second i, I noticed that too and I, my, my only thoughts on that is you gotta remember this it is radial but it's like radial i guess around the different support vectors so if you take a bunch of circles and union them together right you get a blobby shape Mm -hmm. um, isn't that what's mm -hmm. happening i mean it's like yeah each of the kernels i guess are, are like a radial but they're each one is around each support point mm -hmm. or whatever it's called right support vector that's what the oh, it's in the name <laughs> support vector yes so mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. i mean really i don't have much intuition about this whole support vector machine thing i mean a lot of it's quite um in the way I mean, there's so many constant complaints about this book. It's not really a complaint because that's by design and I should accept that, but I like to know how stuff works, right? So I haven't had a chance yet and I don't know if I ever will, but I don't really know how support vector machines work. So I don't really trust them very much. You know what I mean? yeah. So it seems like magic. And I know that I could go read up on it, but I haven't done that. Yeah, I mean, I think the impression I got from reading the chapter presenting last week was that um, like a kernel just seems like a, a special kind of transformation that um, allows you to like, uh, I don't know, like it's it just seemed to me, it just seems like you're just kind of generating new data based on like relations between points, um, you know? Oh. And then the thing we were confused about last week was like with the kernels, it wasn't obvious how it fit into like a model training process. Like, what do you, like, what are you optimizing? Like, um, like I, I think we came to a conclusion that it kind of was supposed to be building off of what they were showing early with the support vectors, with like the betas and, and, and just like you kind of replace the stuff under the summation and all those things with like this kernel. Um, and then, you know, whatever kernel you want, you can put in there, but then in the end, you're still estimating like a couple coefficients based on those kernels i don't know like 
it was just unclear like what is being optimized you know right that was like i felt like that was a little bit um yeah opaque last week but um but yeah this is what i mean about this here like it's very you know it seems like it could almost fit any border this radial kernel um i don't know can you guys see my screen Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we can see it. Sorry, I was muted. No, yeah, good. actually, you know, but I think each one of the X's is a support vector, or no? No way. Uh, I think the sure wait, yeah. Which one yeah, the X's are vectors? support vectors. Yes. Yeah. So my explanation about the circles around the X's doesn't seem to hold up either. Right? I mean, it's like <laughs> it's much more blobby even than that would make sense. Especially, I mean, on the left side, I'm thinking of in particular. Yeah. Huh. I, something I was expecting in these plots was to show like the, like in these, there's still a margin, right? Um, yeah, they don't show the margin, right? They don't show the margin, yeah. Um, no, Ron, but I think you're right, right? Because if the X's are the support vectors, at least on the, like cream colored blob right they're more located along the boundary yeah so mm -hmm. right yeah 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 okay so but how about like this one over here <laughs> yeah, that, i don't know <laughs> well, that one must be responsible for that bottom curve i guess all by itself yeah 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 Probably. it's weird it was also weird to me how much space there is in some of these like mm -hmm. it really yeah what's all that space <laughs> is it just extrapolating like why is it expanded all the way over here i mean i guess there's really no points over here so at all but how does it decide you know whether these are this zero class or the one class or uh, yeah i'm kind of a, a dumb question um is there any way to visualize in like Say that you have, you know, decision boundaries that are plotted for like a very high dimensional space. Is there any way to plot or like to do a 2D embedding of that so that you can sort of visualize the decision boundary? Or is that just not possible? I think one thing I think people do is those, um, like they have the, the this T sign or TSNE uh, graphs that kind of project data onto two dimensions. Um, right, right, right. Okay, okay. Like, like um, UMAP or... Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like one of these, let me just find um, like these here. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it allows you to see like if there's separation yeah. and things like that, but mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I'm not sure like, to me, like when I see these plots, they're always in like kind of odd shapes. It's really hard to interpret like the dimensions and kind of what distance means and like yeah. why they're yeah. organized in a certain way. But I feel like if there's separation, you should see it here, but um, mm -hmm. between the classes, but. I don't know why I was thinking that, you know, the Chisney and you map is just for gene expression. I'm sorry. Because <laughs> oh. I've seen those. And then I was just yeah. like, oh, yeah. OK, good point. OK, that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But I don't know. There's probably other answers to that, too. Um, hmm. I mean, you might use something like PCA and then mm -hmm. visualize you know like the first two factors yeah 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 something like that yeah yeah that, that would make sense yes um Yeah, um, did anyone try out the tidy models version this week? I actually didn't get a chance to do that, but. No, I just did the straight up lab, yeah. I think I'm, it might not be in tidy models yet. Let me just check. Uh, SVM. Oh no, it is, never mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Where'd my slack window go? There it is. See, this is nice here because I think this white is showing the margin here. I like this plot. Where? Like yeah, where? What are you looking at? Oh, do you see my screen still? We just see, see, yeah, we see the R yeah. studio. Oh, it's, it's sharing my window. Sorry, one second. Uh, hey, Shem's here. I was showing all kinds of things. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. All right, now you can see it, right? Hey. Oh, okay, okay. Can you see my uh, tidy mouse? Yeah, that's a better, I like that plot. Yeah, I like these a lot. Yeah, um, looks good. And this, I think this white part is the margin, right? This here. And these. It looks like it might be some kind of scoring. Oh, like a probability of being in a certain class. Yeah. Or distance from the margin or something. Uh, Maybe it's distance from the margin. I don't know. But yeah. it looks like it's a one minus one, so it can't be a probability. Yeah. <laughs> but... Oh, that's really cool. Did they say what, what type of data set they're plotting there, Kevin? This is, is it the same one? It's the same oh, one, yeah. Got it. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. This is just, uh, yeah, uh, normal uh, data sampled from like a normal distribution. Mm -hmm. Just like the lab did. Yeah. We... That's an interesting trick they use, by the way, to like generate the, the separated data, like, like just move them over by adding a little vector to it. Uh, like a, uh, like a, uh, scale or a shift yeah to shift these little eventually these would, that it looks like that would really fit really well with a uh um naive bays right because that's all gaussian assumptions so hmm. i have a question what's uh the difference between an roc curve like what does that give you versus just like the accuracy rate uh, well, I mean, so the accuracy depends on no, I mean, accuracy is like, if you set the threshold right at 50%, right? Like how often do I predict the right things? Mm -hmm. But you gotta remember that sometimes that's not what matters, right? Cause sometimes you, you rather, you'd rather, you know, like, especially in medicine, right? Sometimes you want to be very sensitive and you're okay with a lot of false alarms. So you can move your threshold lower. I'll take a 20% probability uh, for, you know, and then I'll, if it's 20%, I will call it, call it a yes. Right, so now my sensitivity is going to be very high, but I'll get a lot of false alarms. So it's my specificity there. Yeah. My false alarm rate will be will be high, right? In in uh, mm -hmm. in the Bayesian uh, book club, we just talked about this, and um, the example they use is like forecasting the probability of rain. It was a logistic uh -huh. regression, but you know, if you want to be accurate on being yes wrong or about whether it's raining or not, you put your threshold at 50%, but if you're worried about whether you're going to bring an umbrella or not, you'd have to decide, you know, well, how much does it, how much does it bother me to carry an umbrella and how much does it bother me to get wet? And you decide where you want to put your threshold. So the rock curve tells you the overall performance, right? This, the receiver operating characteristics, right? Uh, as you change the line is where your false alarm rate and your uh, sensitivity can be as you vary your threshold. Threshold is not actually shown on there, but that's what, it's a parametric curve, right? So that draws out that, that line. Oh, there's a great, great little slide right there. Yeah. Yeah, I love these, these, uh, these two by two. Specificity. Two's. How do you say that properly? I don't know why I keep my Yeah, my tongue just trips over that every time. <laughs> specificity. Specificity. Yeah. Okay. Specificity. I'll get it right. <laughs> true negative over, over healthy in this case. Okay, right, that's another, very yeah, useful. Can, Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just used to these things. Like when I worked for um, uh, Lincoln Laboratory, we did a lot of like, we were really looking at receivers and wondering what their sensitivity was, right? So like radar receivers and things like that. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, where that, that's where that kind of terminology comes from, receiver operating characteristics. Oh, I see. So in that, oh. in that case, it was still sensitivity and specificity? Yeah. Well, we mostly plotted false alarm rate because we had some kind of idea of like detection decisions that were going to be made and whatnot. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, where does does time receiver operating curve comes comes from, and what does that mean? Because I just read it. I don't know what the meaning. Just you know, receiver operating curve. What does that mean, Rob? Well, it's a plot of your 
false alarm rate and your, you know, your sensitivity versus your specificity, just like it says right there, right? That's what it's a plot of. As you vary your, as you vary your threshold, you can, you'll, you'll, you'll parametrically plot out a line, right? So if you have a very high threshold, you'll get very uh, low false alarms, very high specificity, dang it, I thought I had that, uh, and low sensitivity, but you can also set a very low threshold, in which case you have, you'll be very, very sensitive, but of course you also pick up a lot of false alarms. Yeah. Mm, okay. Right. I mean, think about like uh, in the context of the medical test, like the COVID test, right? They had, they made a decision, like how sensitive do we want this test to be, the PCR test, by how many cycles, right? they could make it more sensitive by having more and more cycles in that case, right? Uh, of mm -hmm. the PCR, or you could make it, but then the more, so you can make it very, very sensitive, but then you have a very false, high false alarm rate, then you have a lot of people with false positive tests. Well, maybe that's okay because the cost is not that high or, you know, you have to make decisions based on that, right? Mm. Yeah. It seems to me that like uh, the question I was going to ask before you said that, and I was going to say, maybe it's a stupid question, but maybe it isn't based on what you just said that like these plots assume that those two quantities are like equally weighted and you want to like mm. maximize the area, but mm. there would be cases, right. Where like you would want like the optimal combination of these two things isn't necessarily upper left in this plot, you know? Right. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, normally they do use the areas kind of like to compare two things, like which one, but you're right. In certain particular cases, you might, well, I don't care about the area. I really only care about this particular sensitivity or whatever. Right. 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 Like if you really need to have a 90% or 99% sensitivity, then you're just going to look at that point and then just pick the one that has the lowest, uh, the highest specificity. Right. 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 So, right. Like if, if you're, if like missing a, a positive case, is a huge Very cost yeah. and and responding to false positives is not a big cost then like there's some kind of there has to be like what is the cost of each somewhere in here yeah you know yeah so i mean that's a, that's decision analysis so the data the data analysis will give you this curve and then say okay decision maker <laughs> right <laughs> where do you want to operate right Right. That's why it's called operating characteristics. Where do you want to operate? These are the operating characteristics. You tell me where mm -hmm. you want to operate. I wonder if like you could um, in that situation, like, you know, do that and then and then figure out what your cost is for each. I don't know, like some kind of a relationship between. You can. And, and Actually, then you could do that kind of cost analysis and you'd look for the expectation value or something like that. And then right? like, and then would you like weight each of these dimensions according to that cost and then. Yeah do this again and do the area under the curve for that weighted version and something like that. Well, I think if you had the, the weights, you would just be able to make a decision. Like this is the point you want to operate where it minimizes that mm -hmm. weight right? mm -hmm. or minimizes the cost, the overall cost, right? The cost yeah, yeah, of false yeah. alarm plus the expected cost of false alarm plus the expected cost of uh, false positive or failing to detect positives, I guess you'd say, right? Right, right, right. False, yeah. False negative, so. false negative, right? So, or yeah. False negative. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean that's so. I mean, often the case though is that you, the decision maker, have, you sometimes you can't do that, right? Like sometimes lives are involved, and you're like, there's no number, so you just have to like give, give the whole, give the full story and let the decision makers work it out. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. Like, what's the cost of human life? I don't want to put that in my equation. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, I, honestly, I think I, we were talking about the lack of like classification problems like in our work or in our life. And I wish I wish I had more problems like this where it's really clear, you know, like where I had a ton of labeled data and mm -hmm. and you know, I could say, oh, I'm, you know, 95% accurate or I have this specificity and this sensitivity. Like it seems like a really clean, like um, I don't know, like. Sometimes I, I look at some of these analyses and I'm like, I wish, I wish it was that simple, you know? Um, but I guess textbook problems are always going to be like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yes. When you, yeah. When you do a real problem, you're always like, well, they didn't tell me about what to do with this case, you know? So you right. Have to figure it out yeah. The de you... decision stuff part of it is so hard. I mean, like, I think yeah. a lot of the time too, you, uh, the people who are given this information also don't know like they're not that aware of what 
how they value each of these different combinations and um, you know these different options and yeah anyway um, cool Ron, was this yeah go just ahead, a sorry. follow up question then so then if you are trying to optimize either sensitivity or specificity for your application whatever it is you know that you've determined is more important how does that affect the overall accuracy it, it sort of goes hand in hand though right or well if you're not operating at a 50 percent threshold then your overall accuracy is going to be down lower than the optimal from that point of view you'll misidentify more cases but again it depends on whether misidentifying mm -hmm. a positive is more important than misidentifying and when i say more important i mean it's not like it's a yes or no there's kind of there's a whole there's a curve right you, you could operate anywhere on that curve uh, that yeah, works yeah, best yeah, for yeah, your yeah. particular okay. situation that makes you're right. sense. You're right. Your accuracy yeah, yeah. will be lower if you operate away from 50%. Your overall accuracy, but again, that may not be the most important thing. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Again, so, you were saying like in a, for example, a health case scenario or with the COVID thing, right, where it might have been costly to misidentify false negatives, right, because they could spread. Yeah. Um, then you would optimize, um, I guess, something to give you better sensitivity. Um, at the cost of some specificity, I guess, because if you have false positives, that wouldn't matter as much. Because then, you know, false positive would mean people just quarantine, you know, and yeah, it's less hard. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't Thank know you. that, that anyone helpful. actually. Yeah, I don't know if anyone ever thought thought it through that way in the, you know, in the CDC. I think they probably just said, "I want the highest." You know, I think they probably did a diminishing return thing. Like, we'll just do as many cycles as we can get. You know, at pretty high. You know, ninety nine whatever percent accuracy and then you know we'll stop there and just absorb whatever the false positive rate is you know <laughs> or well, yeah so yeah uh, yeah yeah i was just thinking so generally the pcrs tend to be fairly accurate depending on you know if you go to a center you took the swab well done because they're so so sensitive in in that yeah. not not sensitive in the classification but just the the assay is very sensitive but like the antigen tests right so like the the home tests where a lot more can go wrong in terms of like people don't know how oh, yeah, to sure. properly read or all of these things and so i wonder you know how they optimize either for sensitivity or specificity um especially during like the whatever you know more deadly variants so yeah at the I wonder about stages, that too. yeah That's good question So would, uh, in the SVM case, I guess this cost would be oh. like it would vary to get that ROC curve? Cost of constraint violation? Doesn't that just yeah. affect the margin? Yeah, maybe. No, I think it's when you get, to, when you get the output of the model, it gives you, um, you can either get classification or you can get a, some kind of some kind of number, right? Mm -hmm. How does it work? I haven't looked at this for a while. There was a way to get a number out, right? To do the rock curve. Obviously, they talk about that somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but oh, wait, so does... you're not you're not running the model a bunch of times with different parameters. You're, no, you're yeah. just taking those raw probabilities and saying like. If we, oh, I see, if we like made the threshold at 0.4 probability or whatever for this class. Yeah, it says here they use, they compute, both classifiers compute this uh, on page um, 383, the bottom, there's this kind of buried comment about how they did this. Um, Cause they said both classifiers compute scores of the form. Oh, maybe it's in the lab better, uh, but anyway, some kind of linear, combination of the vectors and they use that to determine a cutoff mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah i think you can probably help put yeah i have to you have to do hold on, hold on, sorry, let me look at these oh probability yeah, you, yeah. Probability predictions. you can just do this i think uh, There we go. Uh, probably, probably. The, what are those log prob? What are those logistic? I don't know why that's just like one. 
Oh, yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> Certainly. So it's here. Um, allowed for probability predictions. Numerical score for each observation. Actually, you know, I didn't quite follow completely what they were doing with the, with the rock curve calculation, like from the SVM, because you're right, the SVM seems like it just gives out decision values equals true. So um, what does that add? Predict. In the predict function, um, you can ask for decision values, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. These are the support. In order to obtain fitted values for a given model, we can use decision values equals true and fitting SVM. Then the predict function will output the fitted values. I don't know. I I confess that I read this now two weeks ago and I've kind of like <laughs> dribbled out my ears. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was just playing around this, like doing like these the sigmoid. Oh. One. There's a definitely an odd. So oh, some odd shapes. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Like radial seems awesome for that case. Sigmoid. A little bit weird. They show they show what it is here. Using a tangent. Oh, okay, so it says it's possible to obtain the fitted values for an observation. The sign of the fitted value determines which side of the boundary it's on. Therefore, the relationship between the fitted value and the class prediction for a given observation is simple. Okay, so they change, instead of doing it at zero, they do it at some other value to change the threshold. Uh -huh. Right, I see. So it's some linear combination, or it's not a linear, it's a nonlinear kernel, but it's linear kernel, some linear combination of the support vectors. For a nonlinear kernel, it's some other equation that gives you like this score, which is basically kind of like a distance, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here it's saying like, like what is your yeah thresh yeah thresh varying threshold there. So it's not really a probability in this case, just a threshold you can change. Mm -hmm. But again, it's just one fit. You don't change. You just yeah yeah that makes sense. Yeah. So are you guys talking about that cost argument? No, no this is just the like you calculating the um the uh the sensitivity and specificity based on the output of like class predictions right from one oh, model okay. Shem, do you have any input on any of this uh, from this SVM stuff? Did you have any insights to share with us on it? Because I'd love to hear it. <laughs> Sorry, Rob, are you with me? Yeah, I just wondered if you had any insights about this chapter or any thoughts on these SVMs. Do you use them at all or do you? <laughs> I didn't even read the chapter. Actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're on, you're on the hook for next week though, right? You, are you good for that still? Deep learning? Oh yeah. That's my name. Yeah. I will try. <laughs> yeah. So you're that okay, to, cool. yeah. You're okay to present that, okay. Sam? Sorry? You're okay to present that next week? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Should yeah, be good. One, thing, one thing I was looking at is they have, um, just at the code for next week, they have uh, two different versions. They have a mm -hmm. torch and a Keras version. Ah. Yeah, they said there, I can't remember now, but didn't they say there's some issue with the Keras version and it was oh, hard to get they? working on in R for some reason, so they switched oh. over to torch. Oh, yeah, oh, here. there you go. 
original chapter 10 made use of Keras, relies on Python. Torch does not rely on Python. Yeah. That's cool. I've been wanting to try that out. I saw there's a blog post on this from our studio. Um, so that'll be really cool to please note the Torch version is a fair bit slower than the Keras version. Huh? That's nice. Okay. They're, they're just saying that getting the Keras one to work is it could be can be hard because it has some Python dependencies. Mm. But if you're already using Python, then maybe it won't be a big yeah. deal. It's kind of disappointing to hear that it's slower, but I guess yeah, it's isn't it? <laughs> I it's see we're gonna work on that. Pretty recently, like kind of made into this R only version. I think this was created like in the last year or two. I mean, Keras is not that great of a speed demon to begin with, so mm -hmm. uh, yeah. only because of the you know learning and the, neural the networks. Touch, I think uh, is getting you know matured in R as well, but it's still slow, right? <laughs> the yeah. touch ecosystem. Yeah, 2020. It's September 2020. Sorry, I have one more question on, on the rock curve. Can I share my screen? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. All right. Uh, can you see this uh, website? It's uh, towards data science. Yep. Okay, so um, what they have here is essentially, you know, um, they're talking about separability of classes. And so I was just thinking in terms of the, of the SVM, because the chapter pretty much said, right, that um, SVMs, I guess, based on that uh, maximum margin classifier, are useful when the classes are separable to begin with, right? If it's any sort of hazy distinction, it's not going to be as as good to use in an SVM. At least that's what I was understanding, right? Oh, that's a great so, little illustration right there. I like that. Right. Okay. So this would be, you know, um, your population distributions of true negatives and true positives. So if your actual things with labels, right, say you have whatever disease, no disease, right, are separable, then um, it would tell you a lot about how, I guess, your SVM is performing, right? If you do look at the rock curve and then at the distributions of the of, of how it's assigning these these things. And so, and this is what you're talking about, right, Ron? This 50% uh, yeah. threshold? Okay. Yeah. Oh, can you share the link to that? On, uh, oh, yeah. Thingy? I like this website. It explains very- um, I use it a lot, yeah. Easily. I actually signed up, to, uh, signed up for it. Here we go. Um, yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Um, I've also used, seen SVMs used for other types of classification problems, as you guys were asking, like, um, we were trying to classify, not me, but someone else in a lab that I was working on, uh, types of bat calls, like, you know, bat flying mammal bat calls. And oh. so um, an SVM was being applied, yeah, for, you know, because there's all I thought, sorts of I thought for you said bad calls. I'm like, oh, baseball. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, bat, like, you know, there's squeaks or whatever it is that they do. And so... Um, I recall that, yeah, it was a, an SVM, but what I don't sometimes know is why people choose a certain thing. You know what I mean? Sometimes I think it's like, oh, it's the cool kid on the block. So I'm gonna use yeah. that, you know? Um, but obviously, yes, I, I think that like you were saying, it might be worth testing uh, many of the other uh, classification techniques. And so Kevin, this is maybe more a question for you. Is there an easy way to compare different classification um, models easily so that you know it's not all manual using the uh, tidy models oh um yeah i mean uh so yeah you can you can add like um like multiple models to like a workflow um and then mm -hmm. tune them kind of together and then evaluate them together and kind of uh, pluck out the best one that's like a really well supported uh I don't want to use the word workflow because that's I just said that and it's the name of the function. But um, okay. But but yeah, I mean that's that's kind of I think where tiny model shines is that you can 
you know, like lump in a bunch of different models, do, you know, put them all in the same pipeline and then evaluate, evaluate all of them all at once and then pull out the best one and then do a final fit. And then you get like a final, you know, accuracy measure or whatever you're looking at. Um, mm -hmm. And you can, you basically use this, this like yardstick package to pull out whatever metrics you want. You can choose more than one. Um, so you could do like accuracy and like rock off or whatever. Um, okay. And then, uh, and then, yeah. And then you kind of have to say like what metric and you can also define your own. So if you want some custom metric, you can do that too. Um, and then, uh, yeah, you can, you know, use it in the, like that, uh, pipeline and, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty neat. Does it, yeah. does it use cross validation or can you use cross validation? With yeah. That? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's really set up well for that type of thing. Um, I mean, you have to, so like, yeah, like you can, you can use uh, this function like tune. Uh, there's a bunch of variations, but like the basic mm -hmm. one is tune grid and you, you pass the, um, the folded, the folds uh, data. So like our sample has a set of functions where you can do a initial like train test split. And then within the train set, you can say like C vol C uh, was it like V folds underscore C V. You choose like the number of splits on the on the train, and that creates this like R sample object that's all the folds, and then you just pass that to Tune Grid, and it'll like tune over those folds. Um, nice. Okay. Yeah. It's really. Oh, sorry. What What did you say that the was it called workflows or? Yeah, yeah. I would just check out the book. Um, yeah, I think this is. Um, in Which one book? of those chapters in tidy model books. Okay. Tidy models, okay. Yeah. E yeah, in tidy model. yeah. Uh, if I remember correctly, yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, I looked at this book. Yeah, so like, sorry, I'm eating something, but um, like here, um, resampling, um say so you do something like this for the v fold cv you say how many folds you want nice and then you pass oh, wow. it to, yeah, yeah yeah and then you pass it to grid uh like whatever your tuning step is i see if they mm -hmm. have this is just the different so you can do bootstraps as well um and then uh yeah this is a little bit different than i have done fit resamples yeah, I mean, they have a few different ways of doing this. What I've seen is like in the context of these tune functions, let me just see if I can find those. Um, I think it's grid search. Oh, okay, model tuning. Yeah. Yeah, or yeah, grid search, you're right. Um, yeah, so you can do these huh, different okay. kinds of grids. Um, I just want to see one where you have the full flow. I think it's in the end of the chapter, maybe. Uh, usually they put the full code. Uh, this is a big example here. So you have a workflow that's like one or, or, or um, many models. And then this is just a different type of tuning with this okay. race ANOVA thing, but you would pass your folds here. So this is what you did with like V fold CV. Uh -huh. um, uh, you can pass it like a manual or this one. So this one is a, a special kind of tuning function, um, but you just give it like how many different combinations, I guess, to consider or evaluate. Um, and then you give it your metrics that you want to calculate to consider. So like, I'll just find this earlier in the code. Um, so metric set uh, rock awk. So, okay. So here, this is like a yardstick evaluation function and they just have these preset ones like rock oc uh, that you can just throw in there and but you can put in like a list here put in multiple um but yeah and then here you can screen many models this is an example where you um it's like you 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 can like mix and match also like pre-processing and, and two mm -hmm. models that also so i could have like two different uh, you know, pre-processing routines that I want to test. And then I want to combine those with every possible model um, and then show all combinations oh. of those things. So you can do things like oh, that. Geez. So here it's yeah, like, yeah. here they're throwing in like every model you can possibly have. Um, yeah. And then they put in this workflow set. So you have 
Um, so this, the intent, so in this case, there's just one recipe, one pre-processing. So then it'll, it'll uh, use this for all the models. But if you had two here, it would do both those, the kind of product, uh, cross product of this and this. So it'll do all combinations. Um, mm, wow. Yeah, it's, it's awesome for this kind of thing. Like when you have multiple yeah. models and um, yeah, yeah, and then yeah, here yeah. it's doing this workflow map. So um, you give it like the grid, um, the folds that you have, um, and then it'll output like basically here, it'll just sit here. It's like, what metric do I want to use? Or like out of the metrics I provided, if I provide multiple, I'm going to use RMSE, you know, and then it shows like the best model out of all those combinations with like the preprocessor and the model considered together. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Tidy Miles is awesome. I, I've seen a lot of a hate on, on it recently on the internet, but um, people on <laughs> Twitter, see. but. Uh. No, I can see how this would be very, very useful as opposed to like, um, you know, running each thing independently mm -hmm. and then trying to extract the specific thing. I mean, I think the, okay. the thing that it's solving is something that I felt when looking at the this SVM code is that like there's a different um, you know set of like you know API and like like what arguments you have to pass and different things like it's mm -hmm. it's hard to kind of figure out how a particular package wants you to uh, have a workflow you know like like mm -hmm. how do you create a model fit it like and and do predictions like it's not always consistent um so like just looking through this code and running it i was like oh man like i don't know like um like it's not terrible but uh when you look at the uh, the tiny models um lab like basically this is the same for any any kind of model so um like up here you know, if I wanted to use a different classification um, routine, I just change this argument and then change the, like the, um, uh, mm. like some of the tune, like whatever the tuning parameter is. And then, mm. you know, and then you just can run the same code again. Um, yeah. So I like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I actually have to run, I have to catch a train in like 40 minutes um, to go back to Boston. So, um, no, no problem. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for your help. This is uh, very yeah. helpful. Yeah, yeah. So we made a good discussion out of a chapter we weren't really that excited about. Yeah, well, I agree. I, I mean, agree. It was, yeah. it was very timely, right? Because uh, I'm just starting to want to practice on this data. And so I was like, oh, OK, I guess I better know <laughs> this chapter well. Sounds like and you so, have a really cool um, application um, like for yeah. This class yeah, 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 yeah. It, it should be. Um, I'm just really interested in actually seeing, you know, how these things do on like real data sets, which tend to be, you know, a lot messier and then there's a lot of more things to tune. So mm -hmm. one thing I was thinking, by the way, we could just consider it for later, but maybe for a couple of these chapters, we might want to not have a second week. I don't know. Um, yeah, like, I was thinking that too. Mm -hmm. um, like, I don't know how excited we'll be about like unsupervised learning or multiple testing. I'm sorry, right. Sandra, those are both yours, but I know for me, <laughs> no, I'm no, really I'm, excited I'm more about, interested in the theory here. Yeah. I'm really excited about deep learning and survival analysis. Yeah, and I data. Agree. Those two weeks are really exciting to me. So I might want to have a second, you know, questions week, but maybe the last two, we could just do this presentations. I guess we'll see how it goes, but. Yeah, but I think we should leave ourselves open to not having to necessarily do the second week. Mm -hmm. I, most of the other book clubs I mean, don't actually, you know, don't have the second week. So this is kind of unusual on this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. But all, all right. on the other hand, this was a useful discussion today. So. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. Maybe. Very, very helpful. Thank you. Thank Definitely. you all. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Um, see you next week. Yeah. Right. See you on Sunday. Sham with deep learning. Yeah. Looking forward to it. All right. Bye. You too. Bye. Have a good one. Bye.